Hi. Hello. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and providing this opportunity. Um, I'll go back a little bit. Um, it's 1996, and I was very concerned at that time about something that had just appeared in our horizon, HIV and AIDS. Um, it was being talked about in very hushed, hushed ways. It was being um, essentially something that had been closeted. And I came across a show called Positive Lives in Britain by an agency called Network, who essentially were trying to address stigmatization around the story of HIV and AIDS. Uh, and I felt at that time that perhaps we could extend it to doing a chapter in Bangladesh, well, in the subcontinent. Uh, Network was essentially a British uh, agency, all the photographers were Brits. Uh, but Stephen Mays, who was then running the agency, uh, agreed and decided that we would extend the chapters. And there were two non-network photographers taken on board. One was Eugene Richards, a very well-known American photojournalist, and myself. Uh, when I started doing that, I, I had some concerns because I really didn't know enough about myself to know how I would respond to someone who is positive. I'd never knowingly met someone who was positive. I didn't know whether I would recoil, whether I'd be open, whether I'd be able to sit, sit on the same table and have a glass of water. I felt I could, but I didn't know enough about myself. So uh, I went to New York to visit an HIV clinic to test myself. Uh, and there I, I met, I went to this clinic, met the people, and I felt I could deal with it. I also took the opportunity to visit Eugene. I, I knew, we knew of each other, but we'd never actually met. So I went to Brooklyn, we, we met, we had a great time. And as I'm leaving, he says, um, I'll take you to the metro or the subway, whatever it is in the United States. So he comes into the train and I'm actually going to Harlem. I go up and I come out to do the work I was going to do. And he comes out with me. And after a while he says, I'll go back. Where were you going? He says, I wasn't going anywhere. I just wanted to prolong that conversation. We don't have conversations like that very much. And it got me thinking that a big name like Eugene Richards in the United States doesn't have conversation on photography. He says, well, when I meet other photographers, we're talking of assignments, we're talking of rates, we're talking of contracts. We don't really talk about the issues so much. So that, that stuck in my mind. But I'll move on from, from that to the work itself that I started doing in Bangladesh. Um, and one of the stories I was doing was on a group of sex workers who worked, who distributed condoms to their peers. So these workers worked very close to a very famous building in Bangladesh, um, the House of Parliament, which was designed by Louis Kahn. Um, and they, every evening, walked around, met their peers, gave them condoms, and just did whatever they did. Um, and I met this woman, Hajira, uh, who was one of the sex workers, and we got to be very good friends. I did my work, I worked on other, other stories and I, around HIV and AIDS. Um, and, but Hajira and I, and, and that group, we, we became very close. They would come and visit us, stay with us sometimes, which at that time was probably unusual in middle class Bangladeshi homes. Sex workers coming to your house, staying with you, being friends was probably not so common. So there was a certain uh, rapport between ourselves. Um, there were other things that happened. I mean, that, that story led to the first exhibition in our gallery where we showed gay people. Uh, it had never, gay people had never been shown in Bangladesh. And we weren't sure how, how easy it would be. And one of the things we did at that time to protect uh, those, those who were photographed was to give them pseudonyms. So we gave them pseudonyms, we put up the pictures, and we changed the caption a little bit. One of the boys, Royal, he, in his interviews, had said, I'd been introduced to sex by an imam. And I thought that might be a little bit problematic. <laughs> so we changed it to, I was introduced to sex by a religious man. Uh, that said, we put up the pictures without their names. 
They came to the show, they loved it. And the following day they come up and say, we want our names back. Yeah? So they actually wanted to come out of the closet. They'd been in the closet for so long. This, they felt, was an opportunity for them to come out, and we did. Uh, we did other things as well. In the rooftop, we had hijras doing very suggestive dancing, which made uh, many of our guests quite uptight, but they went along with it. But I, I say all this because all of that was part of a process we were beginning where we wanted to bring out issues uh, that needed to be debated. Hajira and her sister set up um, an NGO to help other sex workers because you know, there was discrimination, there were the problems that they dealt, got in touch, uh, faced. And it, it worked to an extent, but she was dis disillusioned by the NGO circuit and uh, eventually gave up, though her sister carried it on. Uh, and we've stayed friends over the years for a long time, but there was a long gap. And then I began to look for stories that I felt were needed, particularly in social media. We looked at, uh, and actually it started with Facebook. Facebook approached us to say, here's this great tool, social media, so many conversations going on, but very few real issues being discussed. A lot of the conversations are very flippant, very loose. Perhaps this model could be used to talk about important stories. And that's when I thought I'd revisit Hajira to see what she was up to. And that's when I discovered that she'd done something quite remarkable. She had had a very, very difficult life. She, she'd been gang raped, abused, horribly abused as a child, uh, and eventually ended up as a sex worker. But she wanted to do things uh, at some point. And in between the period when I last saw her and this time, she'd saved up money from her sex work, and then eventually set up this orphanage. She decided there were kids who needed a home and she would give them the home. So I went to visit her in her home and um, all the kids were around, it was messy, but she had very strict regime. They had to study properly, everyone had to do housework, they cleaned, they cooked, the elder kids looked after the smaller kids. Uh, they had to pray, they had to do well in school, they had to be tidy, they had to be healthy. All sorts of very motherly things that she did. But she absolutely adored these kids. And I discovered that she didn't actually take a salary. Um, she, some friends of ours had pooled some money together which helped this thing go on, but she didn't take a salary. And said, well, what do you do? How do you get on? She says, I have a roof over my head. When my kids eat, I eat. And I have 30 children that call me mother. What more can I want? And that really got me into it. I did the story. Facebook loved the story, but felt it was too hot for them to actually uh, send it out. So it stayed, uh, stayed with me. I was happy I'd, I'd done the story, and uh, they moved on to other things. Uh, and that's really what brings me to this. So this story is about Hajira's family. And I'll start with um, this picture, which is in a place called Adabor, where it's uh, not so well, well to do part of Dhaka. And up the stairs is, is this place. What is very interesting and what I found fascinating was the fact that uh, the, the landlord was very, very supportive. Uh, and this landlord, he's the guy standing here, a very devout Muslim. Um, someone who's been to Hajj and, you know, very religious. This guy, absolutely complete. It was under his patronage that she could do what she did. It's not so easy uh, to set up a home when you're a sex worker yourself and it's known you're a sex worker. You have children who are children of sex workers setting it up. And this religious gentleman decided no, this was something that needed to be supported. So they were there. They don't actually live there now because it got too big. When the kids started getting bigger, then you had to have a separate room for the girls, a separate room for the boys, and a little, bre little bit of breeding space. But that's what she started. And this, these, all these pictures were taken in that other place, 
now she has a new place. I haven't actually been there yet. I need to see it. But this was very typical of how I found uh, Hajira, you know, surrounded by her kids, delicing kids while she's talking on the phone and um, with all the kids around her and studying and whatever else. So I'll go back to this picture. Um, I, I haven't seen the new home, so I don't really know, but I could see how they use the space. So the floor of this place was also the dining table. It was the slate, uh, and this was how she taught the kids how they did homework. And she was very strict about homework. Um, so uh, I'll move on to that, really. This is uh, one of the girls who goes to a school run by uh, an NGO, which you will know, BRAC. Uh, uh, but what Hajira also does is she allocates some money, not only for them to go to the school, the free school, but also get to get private tuition. And she insists on her kids getting the best education they possibly can. Um, so one of the kids, uh, you'll see Mim on the other, in the other room, has gone to a very well-known boarding school. And um, I visited Hajara a few days back. She was, because of uh, the life she's led, she, she had a very difficult life. Um, and she had a tumor which had burst and she was not, bothering about it, she wanted to look after the kids, uh, but obviously it got to a bad situation. She was in hospital, she, she had a hysterectomy, um, but two days ago she actually left hospital. Um, so when she was there, Mim came back and all the kids were there. You know, the kids were, it was very much, you know, their mum was in hospital, so the kids became mum, uh, but she was still concerned about their studies. So let's go and look at some of the other pictures. So this is the other photograph I was going to tell you about. Um, Chopin, the, the boy there, um, he was abandoned when he was a two-month-old baby. Um, so that's, that's when Hajara took her on. And uh, you, know, you can see the sort of relationship that they have. The, she also has another child uh, who is physically handicapped uh, and cannot speak. Uh, but again, she has a very special, very strong tie with these kids. Um, this young boy, um, one of the things she encourages very, very much is uh, for, for the kids to do what they want. Uh, while they, she insists that they study, while she insists that they do all the housework, that they look after themselves and they pray, but the kids have complete freedom when it comes to their aspirations. Uh, and this kid is uh, Michael Jackson aspirant. Uh, there are several others. They want to be models, they want to be dancers, they want to be doctors, and it doesn't matter. In most middle class homes, this was the same with me. You know, in a middle class home, you're expected to become a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, or do something else that gives you a respectable profession. Uh, this was a family where you could do whatever you wanted which I found very enjoyable. So this is Mim, a very bright student, who's the one who's gone to uh, the boarding school, but she was the one looking after her mum uh, in the hospital in the last few days. Lima there. So you've got kids of all ages, from someone as small as that to children who are now going to high school. Shortly before I arrived, they'd actually pulled together some money to get some bunk beds. So this was a boy who, who in you know, wanted to pose by the bunk bed because you know, that was a proud possession. Um, and this is bath time. Um, I don't really have very much more to say. Uh, I think you need to really experience it. But for me, what was very, very special is that often um, philanthropy or looking after people is, is something that we, we've thought of happening by people who have a a lot of resources by bigger organizations and certainly NGOs in our country have played a very big role. One of the things we have forgotten and I think uh, done a disservice to is we've forgotten that probably the most generous people in our communities are our poor, without a doubt. I, I know extremely poor families in my country. I do not know a single family that does not support another. And there's this incredible social structure through which people have come up. My, my grandfather, 
uh, was what, I don't know if you have it in your country, called Jagir. Yeah? yeah? So he was an orphan who was brought in as um, um, a teacher of the children. And as often happens, you know, that's the time when they follow you and look at you. And if you're okay, you become the bri uh, bridegroom of one of the, and that's, that's how my grandmother got married. And the, in his particular case, uh, his qualifications or what helped him was the fact that he was an orphan. So my grandmother's parents felt, since he's an orphan, he won't abandon her. You know? <laughs> so that's what it was. He was a good man. They'd watched him for a while. He was a teacher, and then they got married. Uh, but there are all those situations. Uh, I know many, many of our writers who've started off life as Jagis and eventually have found homes within, within those families and uh, have have bettered themselves. But invariably, and I, I will end with a small example, um, in the 1991 cyclone in Bangladesh, and sadly that's what you know Bangladesh for. You know it for cyclones, disasters. You don't know it for people like Hajara or people like Idi in Pakistan who do this incredible work, which is unknown. But uh, um, I went to a place called Kutubdia. It was absolutely ravaged, uh, really. Uh, there was nothing left, and over 139,000 people had died in that cyclone. Uh, and when I went, the people offered me a coconut. And during the cyclone, that is, water is absolutely the most precious thing. You might have other things, but water you don't have, drinking water. So they brought this coconut. I said, look, you know, I've come over. I'm going to go back to a hotel. I have food back there. You need it. And he said, this is all we have to give. You can't say no. Mm. Uh, and I, I remember that. Uh, it's, it's such a powerful feeling. And in a sense, I come to places like this and we talk about what the elite do, what foundations do, what so many other things do. And we forget that the biggest philanthropists in our community are our poor. And I'd like to dedicate this, this to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.